9 Disturbing Missing Persons Stories That'll Give You Sleepless Nights These people who disappeared mysteriously present some of the most intriguing historical puzzles around, especially when their unexplained disappearances stay open for years. Mysterious disappearances can vary from suspected political assassinations to cases, where somebody goes out in a boat, never to be heard from again. Regardless of the circumstances, they're always fascinating and often tragic. 1. Sean Flynn 45 years ago, Sean Flynn, an acclaimed war photojournalist and the son of Golden Age Hollywood superstar Errol Flynn, disappeared without a trace while on assignment in Southeast Asia. Now, archives from the estate of his mother, Errol Flynn's first wife, Lily Damita, have gone up for auction, giving a rare glimpse into the life of one of Hollywood's most daring descendants. Sean Flynn's disappearance in 1970 captivated the country, he was so young. Bobby Livingston, executive vice president at Boston-based RR Auction, tells People. Sean Flynn was the only son of action hero Errol, best known for his swashbuckling escapades in 1938's The Adventures of Robin Hood. After Flynn pursued a brief acting career, starring in the 1962 sequel The Son of Captain Blood and appearing in George Hamilton's Where the Boys Are, he found his true calling in photojournalism, traveling to dangerous war zones, from Israel during an Arab-Israeli conflict to Vietnam and Cambodia, taking pictures for Time, Paris Match and United Press International. During the Vietnam War, Flynn parachuted into combat zones with U.S. troops. In 1970, as North Vietnamese troops made advances in the country, Flynn traveled to Cambodia on assignment for time. On April 6, 1970, Flynn and fellow photojournalist Dana Stone were leaving the Cambodian capital of Phnom Penh when they got word of a checkpoint on Highway 1 manned by the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communist soldiers. Stone and Flynn took off for the highway on motorcycles, turning down the limousines that most journalists used, to get a first-hand look on the way to a press conference in Saigon now Ho Chi Minh City. The pair were never heard from again. While never confirmed, reports cited by Time claimed that Flynn and Stone were captured by Viet Cong guerrilla fighters, and held captive for up to a year before being killed by the Cambodian communist organization Khmer Rouge. However, no remains of either man were ever found. Now, the world has a rare glimpse of Sean Flynn via the keepsakes of his mother, who died in 1994, after exhausting her finances in the search for her son. The collection of letters, photographs and mementos includes pictures of the handsome photographer throughout his life and early letters that reveal a young man determined to chart his own path. Even in high school, he writes to his mom, If father and MGM want me to do a picture, they can all go to hell, I just want to be with my family. In another, he writes about looking for a job in construction loading cement. In one haunting letter, Flynn expresses his appreciation for his mother. I just want to say thanks for home, the car, and just the fact that you are the best mother that I could ever want, and although you never hear me say it, I love you very much. I actually tried to be with you a lot but everything just didn't seem to go together. The collection includes a gold embroidered red silk banner with original packaging sent to his mom from Vientiane, Laos, during his last trip to the Vietnam War. The archive also includes materials she kept after Flynn's disappearance, such as a Whatever Happened to Sean Flynn bumper sticker along with a Where is Sean Flynn t-shirt with a picture of the late photojournalist. Flynn's name and disappearance date are engraved on p.o.w.m.i.a. Bracelets produced by the Voices in Vital America organization, a Los Angeles-based student group that made the bracelets during the war. Flynn's friends, including British photographer Tim Page, who recently went to Cambodia to look for clues about Flynn's disappearance, are still searching for the missing adventurer. The auction ends May 13 at 7 p.m. 2. William Morgan On the evening of September 12, 1826, William Morgan, 1774-1826, disappeared outside the city jail in Canandaigua, New York State, three months before the publication of his book revealing the secrets of the first three degrees of Freemasonry. Witnesses heard Morgan shout murder. 
as he was forced into a carriage by four men. The carriage drove off into the night, and Morgan was never seen again. Reports of Morgan's disappearance raised questions about the extent of Masonic involvement in the incident and launched one of the great conspiracy panics in American history and created a national anti-Masonic movement. Morgan had a checkered past and a dubious reputation. Born in Virginia in 1774, he worked as a stonemason, brewer, merchant, farmer, and clerk, and contemporary accounts describe him as a quarrelsome alcoholic, in and out of jail for unpaid debts. In the early 1820s, he moved from Ontario, Canada, to upstate New York, settling in Rochester and then in Batavia. At some point in his life he had either become a Mason or learned enough from published exposures of Masonic ritual to pass as a Mason. No record of his initiation into the three degrees of craft masonry survives, though he certainly attended Masonic lodges in upstate New York in the early 1820s. Soon afterward, he sought admission to a Masonic lodge in nearby Leroy, and received the Royal Arch degree in 1825. Morgan was initiated into the lodge, but when he supported the formation of a new lodge in Batavia, other members of the proposed lodge took his name off the petition, thus denying his membership. Morgan, infuriated, quit the Batavia Lodge and decided to avenge himself on Masonry by writing a book that revealed its secrets. The hope of making money may also have played a significant part in his plans. In March 1826, Morgan retaliated by entering into a contract with local printer David C. Miller and two investors to publish an expose of the secrets of Freemasonry. When word got out about his plan, local Masons tried to prevent the book's publication. Miller, Morgan and other backers of the project were harassed and threatened, but went forward with the project. On September 10, 1826, some three weeks after Morgan had received a copyright for his book, Illustrations of Masonry, Miller's print shop was set on fire in an apparent attempt to stop the book's publication. The same day, a member of the Canandaigua Masonic Lodge obtained a warrant for Morgan's arrest on charges of petty theft. The next evening he was released for lack of evidence but was immediately rearrested on debt charges and imprisoned in the Canandaigua jail. The following night, Morgan was abducted from the jail and forced into a carriage by four men. He was never seen again. The jailer's wife heard a shrill whistle, went to the window, and witnessed Morgan struggling and shouting as he was forced into a carriage and taken away. Exactly what happened to Morgan after that remains a mystery. He was apparently held prisoner for several days at the abandoned Fort Niagara and his captors tried to convince him to accept a large cash sum, withdraw the book, and emigrate to Canada. Rumors for years thereafter claimed that he had been seen in Canada, or British Honduras, or the Turkish city of Smyrna. One account claimed that he had run away to the west and become an Indian chief, another that he had turned pirate and been hanged in Cuba. The most popular accounts of a conspiracy, which was said to involve nearly 70 Masonic brethren, held that Morgan had initially been taken to Canada, where plans to pay him in exchange for staying out of the United States had fallen through. After a few days, according to these charges, he was bound with weights and thrown into the Niagara River just below the falls. When the decomposed male corpse was found near Lake Ontario more than a year after Morgan's disappearance, the corpse was initially identified and buried as Morgan, though many charged that the local coroner, hoping to please the anti-Masonic movement, had deliberately ignored signs that called its identity into question. The body was later exhumed and identified as one Timothy Munro. Morgan's body was never recovered. The Morgan affair also fed public alarm about the amount of influence the Freemasons had on government. Half of all officials in the county where Morgan disappeared, and as many as two-thirds of office holders across New York State, including the Governor DeWitt Clinton, belonged to Masonic Lodges. Morgan's book, Illustrations of Masonry, nonetheless appeared in December 1826. Other sources said it was released in 1827, was an instant bestseller, and filled with blood-girdling descriptions of supposed Masonic rituals and vengeance oaths, which prompted an investigation of the order by New York state legislators in 1829. By that time the governor of New York, DeWitt Clinton, had offered rewards of $300, a large sum by early 19th century standards, 
for information leading to the arrest of Morgan's abductors, and a grand jury in Canandaigua had indicted four Masons for conspiracy to kidnap. Three of them pled guilty but claimed they had no idea where Morgan was. Conspiracy to kidnap was then a misdemeanor in New York and the defendants served jail terms of between two years and three months. The resulting investigation went on for five years. A total of 54 Masons were indicted and 39 were tried, but only 10 were convicted of crimes, and no definitive resolution of the case was found, while 13 other Masons fled the state to avoid trial. The third and last special counsel, who had the remarkable name of Victory Birdseye, finished his inquiry in 1831. Years later, a mason named Henry Vance confessed on his deathbed that he and two other lodge members had murdered Morgan and dumped his body in the Niagara River. However none of these provided any conclusive evidence. Whatever the facts of the matter, charges of a Masonic cover-up in the Morgan affair fueled the first national mass anti-Masonic movement, which spawned dozens of newspapers, and other publications and created a political party. Their publication 3. Emanuela Orlandi The mysterious disappearance of the 15-year-old daughter of a Vatican official is Italy's most enduring cold case. Emanuela Orlandi vanished while on her way home from a flute lesson in July 1983, and was never seen again. It sparked an international intrigue that has pointed to the Stasi, the Italian mob and even a satanic sex cult among the cardinals. The teenager, the fourth of five children in a devoutly Catholic family was enticed to meet her abductors with the offer of some work distributing leaflets at a fashion show for Avon Cosmetics. In reality, the Avon job did not exist. No one has ever been convicted of her disappearance and no body has ever been found. The original theory followed by investigators was that she was kidnapped to secure the release of the would-be assassin who tried to kill John Paul II. But Vatican insiders have claimed that she died under the influence of drugs at a satanic sex party with prelates. Others insist she was is still alive and living secretly in a convent with the knowledge of the Vatican. In the latest investigation, prosecutors worked on the premise that Emanuela was kidnapped and killed by extreme right Italian mobsters, who had lost tens of millions of dollars after they invested it in the troubled Vatican Bank. A witness claimed said she saw the teenager's body wrapped in a bin bag, thrown into a cement mixture, in a seaside resort near Rome. But now judges in Italy have controversially closed the decades-old case in what will seemingly remain one of the country's greatest unsolved mysteries. Despite fierce opposition from the Orlandi family, investigators said there was not enough evidence to go to trial. Today, in an exclusive interview Emanuela's brother Pietro told of his astonishment at the decision to bring to an end the family's 32-year quest for justice. We want to reach the truth, whatever it is, he told Mail Online. There are still so many indications to investigate. I ask myself how, after so many years have passed, it is possible that there is no one on this earth with the courage to say what happened. The family has always hoped that Emanuela is still alive somewhere and have appealed to Pope Francis to open the Vatican files, shedding light on a shadowy hour in its history. But while Francis appears to have cleaned up the Vatican Bank and promises to bring transparency to the Church, he has refused to provide the family with the answers they need. When the newly minted Pope met the schoolgirl's mother Maria at a Mass in 2013, he shook her hand and said, Emanuela is in heaven. Her brother Pietro, surprised, told the Pope, until there is proof to the contrary, I live in hope that she's alive. And I hope you will help me find the truth. But the Pope repeated, she's in heaven. Since then, Pietro says, he has repeatedly tried to get an explanation from the Vatican but has not received a reply. I want to understand if she is dead or alive. He says she's dead now. How does he know? He said, the truth must come from the Vatican, he said. She was a Vatican citizen. But they have never collaborated with investigators. They have always obstructed the investigation. They have behaved in a way that is not Christian. A month after Emanuela went missing, he was told of a memo from the Italian Prime Minister's office to the Vatican recommending, that they do not, with the Orlandi's case, open a Pandora's box that would be difficult to close. He said now. It must be a secret that weighs heavily on the church. I think that the case has been closed after 32 years because they still don't want to open the Pandora's box.
Pietro claims a Monsignor told him that John Paul II had made Emmanuel's disappearance an official pontifical secret, an order that no one in the Vatican would dare break. Emmanuel, a talented musician who attended lessons at a conservatory three times a week, spent the afternoon of June 22, 1983 buying pizza ingredients for the family's supper. There was no hint that she would run away, her family says. She left home wearing a white t-shirt, denim overalls and running shoes, took a bus across the river, then walked the final few yards to her flute lesson next to Santa Apollinaire Church. She phoned home after her lesson at 7 p.m. telling her sister about the Avon job and agreed to discuss it with her parents. That was the last time they heard from her. When she didn't return home that night her father filed a missing persons report and the worried family placed an advert in the local newspaper. As they searched in vain over the next few days, the family received phone calls from two men who claimed to have met a girl matching Emmanuel's description carrying a flute. The callers claimed, possibly in an effort to delay a police search, that she had run away, but would return for her sister's wedding that September. Then on July 3, 11 days after Emmanuel disappeared, Pope John Paul made a public appeal for her speedy return, at his weekly audience in St. Peter's Square. It was the first time the Orlandi family heard someone suggest Emmanuel had been kidnapped, Pietro explained. And it catapulted the case into the public eye. Two days later a third caller claimed that he and his gang were the kidnappers, and were negotiating with the Vatican for the release of Mimitaliagda, the Turk who attempted to kill the Pope in 1981. There were more than a dozen calls between the kidnappers and the Vatican Prime Minister, the Pope's number two, via a special direct line. The Vatican has always refused to hand the tapes of those conversations over to the courts or the family. Italian newspapers received letters from a group calling itself the Turkish Anti-Christian Liberation Front demanding Agka's release. But investigators later found that the real source of these letters was the Stasi the East German Intelligence Service. Emmanuel is kidnap they concluded, was an attempt to blackmail the Pope into ending his funding of the Polish trade union Solidarity Movement, which was threatening to bring down communism. The Stasi wanted it to look like Islamic terrorism. In December 1983, the Pope visited the Orlandi family. He told them only that the case involved international terrorism. A few days later he visited his would-be assassin Agga in jail and forgave him. But Emmanuel still was not returned. According to some witnesses, she was already dead. Investigative journalist Pino Nicanori, who wrote three books on the case, claimed in a 2008 book, that Emmanuel had a relationship with a cardinal and died the night she disappeared in a sex game gone wrong. Later, the Catholic Church's chief exorcist Gabrielle Amrath alleged she was part of a pedophile sex ring in the Vatican and was killed in a satanic orgy. In 1997 the inquiries were halted, they were useless as the Vatican refused to cooperate with the Italian investigators. Without getting any closer to truth, Emmanuel's father Arcoli died in 2004. He always held on to the belief that she was being held hostage in Turkey and would one day come home. Then in 2005, there appeared to come a breakthrough. A former member of the right-wing crime syndicate Benda della Magliana, which terrorized Rome in the 1970s and 80s, claimed that the gang had kidnapped Emanuela. The group was laundering its profits of their robbery, kidnap and extortion through the Banco Ambrosiano, a bank closely tied to the Vatican's own bank, Antonio Mancini claimed. But the Banco Ambrosiano collapsed in 1982, and its head Roberto Calvi was found hanging from London's Blackfriars Bridge. The gang leader, Enrico Renatino de Pedis wanted to retrieve the money, and used Emanuela to blackmail the Vatican, he claimed. The claim was corroborated by de Pedis' former lover, Sabrina Minerti, who told prosecutors that she had seen Emanuela's dead body thrown into a cement mixer in November 1983. Emanuela was initially taken to a house on the seaside, then an apartment with a vast underground cavity, on the giant Nicolo Hill near the Vatican, she said. She was then entrusted to a priest. High-level Vatican insiders, including the head of its bank, Archbishop Paul Marcinkus were involved in the plot, 
she claimed. Minerdi abused cocaine for years and parts of her account are clearly wrong, but lead prosecutor Giancarlo Capaldo found elements of it convincing. The underground cellar on Gia and Niccolo had almost certainly been used as a prison. The investigation was restarted, and six people were put under formal investigation as suspects, including Minerdi and the driver although the Pegasus himself had been shot by rivals. After tip-off, it emerged that the crime boss had been given a secret grave in the Basilica of St. Apollinaire, attached to the very building where Manuela had her music lessons. In 2012, investigators opened his diamond-encrusted tomb, and amid the stench of death found additional human remains, including the skull of a young girl. The macabre mystery could finally be solved it seemed. But DNA tests shows that the remains did not belong to Emanuela. The prosecutor said that high up people in the Vatican knew what happened and should be questioned. But following the statement the new chief prosecutor took over the case, Giancarlo Capaldo was demoted to deputy. Over the decades the family has been tortured with sightings, incredible claims and obvious hoaxes. They went to London where Emanuela was supposedly living in a psychiatric hospital but there was no trace. A woman in a convent in Luxembourg falsely claimed to be Emanuela. A paparazzo even stole tampons from the family bins and claimed to have conducted DNA tests on them which proved that Emanuela was in fact alive and was pretending to be her brother Pietro's wife. Amid all the red herrings, the family believe crucial evidence has been ignored. Agda, the attempted assassin, spent 19 years in an Italian prison before returning to Turkey. Last December he drove across the Balkans to Rome and demanded to be interviewed by investigators on the Orlandi case. To Pietro's disappointment he was swiftly deported and his testimony was not taken. But he told Italian television show Cordo Grado that the girls were kidnapped on the orders of the Iranian government, in order to obtain his freedom, with help from inside the Vatican. He added, after my return to Turkey, Emanuela Orlandi was freed and sent to the Vatican. Now she is in a convent so that the complicity of the Vatican with the Iranian government is never revealed. Pietro said, There are so many theories, each one worse than the last, and every one of them has some truth in it. But with this case there have always been so many distractions to keep us away from the truth. In April this year, the chief prosecutor requested the closing of the case saying the witnesses were not reliable and there was not enough evidence to go to trial. But, in a remarkable act of defiance, Gapaldi, the original prosecutor who had doggedly pursued the case since 2005, refused to sign the document. In spite of his objection, the case was closed. Over 32 years the missing person's photograph of Emanuela wearing an his Roma headband has become an icon for justice refused. The Orlandas feel betrayed by the Vatican but they will never give up, Pietro says. The Vatican were our family. My mother still lives there. We were all citizens. I grew up there playing there in the gardens. It's still home. I don't understand why they turned their backs on us. Pope Francis said who is indifferent is complicit. So for me they are complicit. 4. Natalie Holloway Ten years after Natalie Holloway went missing, a Dutch citizen says he knows where to find her. Prosecutors, however, aren't buying it. Jurian de Jong told CNN's Martin Savage that the teen's body is buried in a crawl space at a Marriott vacation property in Aruba, and he believes he saw her in her final moments. De Jong says he was near Marriott's Aruba Surf Club, then under construction, on the night of May 30, 2005 when he saw a young man chase a young woman through the construction site. At first, he thought the two were being playful, but he says a short time later the man reappeared, carrying the woman in his arms. He says her body appeared limp. He pulled, the woman, by the ankles inside the crawl space, stayed inside for a minute and then came out and closed the gap, De Jong said. Even though De Jong suspected he had witnessed something serious, he says didn't go to the police because he was involved in illegal activities at the time. When news of Holloway's disappearance came out, De Jong put the pieces together, but for three years he says he stayed quiet, afraid he'd be indicted for his own crimes. He also says he was afraid of talking to police and facing retaliation from the people he worked for in his illegal activities which he declined to specify. De Jong says he had a change of heart after seeing a 2008, 
Dutch broadcast of an undercover interview with Jeroen van der Sloot, who was brought in for questioning in Holloway's disappearance but never charged. In that interview, van der Sloot said that Holloway died while the two were together, and her body was dumped in the ocean. De Jong says he got angry because he knew it was a lie and says he felt bad because he has a daughter close to Holloway's age. Van der Sloot later said he was lying in that interview. De Jong then called Holloway's father, Dave Holloway, who has never given up hope of finding his daughter. Holloway had faced many false leads and hoaxes before and wrote De Jong off. I was running out of possibilities, De Jong said. I tried to convince the head prosecutor, the parents, then I tried to convince the other head prosecutor, but he didn't listen. That's when De Jong attempted what he called Mission Impossible. The site where De Jong says Holloway is buried now rests under the high-rise Marriott Aruba Surf Club Resort, in an area called the Spyglass Tower. De Jong bought an electric drill with a diamond tip and went to Aruba to investigate the site. He says he carefully planned a scheme to drill a hole through the hotel floor but his efforts to take a look in the tower's foundations ultimately failed. Next, De Jong turned to local newspapers. But before long, the new lead hit a snag. On the night Holloway disappeared, officials say construction of the spyglass tower hadn't started. Aruba's chief prosecutor, Eric Gulthoff, says he spent weeks investigating De Jong's assertions including a 2010 sworn statement to police. When asked about what construction was underway on May 30, 2005, Olthoff says Marriott officials said there was no construction at the spot De Jong pointed out. It's evident now the story of Mr. De Jong can be true, so that's a closed book, Olthoff told CNN. On the other hand, some signs complicate Marriott's official timeline of the construction of Spyglass Tower. A satellite image from Google Earth taken in June 2005, just a few weeks after Natalie Holloway disappeared, shows what appears to be the blurry outlines of structures that could resemble a construction site. Holloway's father says he remembers the site from the day after his daughter's disappearance. I can't tell you for a fact. I was there on June 1st and there was definitely construction in that area, he says. Holloway says he has information that construction began in February, but he was not clear on how he knows. Natalie Holloway was last seen on May 30, 2005. CNN's Savage received this statement from Jeff Flaherty of Global Corporate Relations at Marriott International Inc. Mr. De Jong has contacted Marriott in the past and each time we have suggested to Mr. De Jong that he present his account of the matter to the authorities. As we have done all along, we cooperate fully with the authorities whenever they are conducting an official investigation. For his part, De Jong says he believes authorities are dragging their feet. It's the inconvenient truth. It would damage the image of Aruba as one happy island, he says. Olthoff won't say that De Jong is lying but says his statement can be true. It's a statement of the management of the Marriott that at that time, at that place, there was no construction. When there's no construction, Natalie Holloway can't be buried in the crawl space under the foundation, he said. And, he added, that Marriott has provided proof. I think he's desperate. I mean the only reason why he does that is that he's afraid that people go to believe me, he said. In the United States. He's been indicted on federal charges of extortion and wire fraud. American authorities accuse him of extorting money from Holloway's mother by offering bogus information about her daughter's disappearance. 5. Ambrose Bierce Ambrose Bierce was a Civil War soldier turned writer perhaps best known for his pioneering science fiction short stories, as well as the unbelievably cynical, and oftentimes completely accurate, book, The Devil's Dictionary. He was 71 in 1913, when he decided to pull up roots to head into Mexico and meet up with Pancho Villa. From there, he simply disappeared, leaving behind no shortage of wild speculation and rumors, from an execution by Mexican rebels to a reunion with his otherworldly acquaintances. We can't help but think that Ambrose Bierce would be absolutely thrilled with the rumors that his disappearance has spawned. Notoriously sardonic and cynical, Bierce's work is laden with condemnation of the human nature and its condition. All in all, perhaps a mysterious disappearance is exactly what he wanted.
The best place to start is with what's known for sure. Pierce was born in Ohio on June 24, 1842, and enlisted in the Union Army Infantry in Indiana. After fighting through and surviving some of the most horrific battles of the Civil War, he was discharged after suffering a severe head wound. These early experiences shaped not only his literary career but his entire adult life. When he was traveling from Washington, D.C. to Mexico in 1913, he stopped along the way to pay his respects at the Civil War battlefields where he had fought. In the early 1900s, Pierce suffered great personal tragedy, burying two of his three children and his wife, several months after she filed for divorce. He began to speak of going to Mexico, to meet up with the rebels that were tearing the country apart, with a civil war so much like the one of his youth. He wanted to recapture that youth, he wanted to cheat death, he wanted to meet Bancho Villa and write with him. So he made arrangements regarding the control and distribution of his estate and assets, visited his Civil War memories, and rode into Mexico. One letter came from across the border, with the final line, As to me, I leave here tomorrow for an unknown destination. Then, nothing. There are no official confirmed reports of him in Mexico and no evidence of where he went once he crossed the border. His sole remaining daughter even successfully recruited the U.S. government to search for him, but to no avail. His disappearance spawned amazing, fantastic theories about what happened to the aging writer. Some theories, run-of-the-mill as Bear's disappearance theories go, state that he made it into Mexican territory where he was killed in the middle of civil war fighting. Alternately, Stories are told of an old gringo who joined up with Pancho Villa, and was then either executed by Pancho or became one of his most trusted advisors. Some people have claimed to see his grave marker, but it has never been confirmed. Another theory is that he simply sent his last letter, then committed suicide in such a way to guarantee he was never discovered. One popular story is that Beers met up with British adventurer F.A. Mitchell Hedges and they went on to steal several Mayan artifacts. Pierce was then supposedly captured and executed in Honduras. Dot. Or he was taken to a Mayan temple where he was held captive, dressed in the skins of a jaguar, and worshipped as a god. Some sources claim that Ambrose Pierce never existed at all. Another has him committing himself to an insane asylum, where all traces of him were lost among the other lunatics. Two years after his disappearance, he was supposedly fighting in France with British World War I troops. Supernatural forces are sometimes blamed for his mysterious disappearance, too. Either the crystal skulls he discovered with Mitchell Hedges called him back to the alien creators, or, because he disappeared about the same time as a man named Ambrose Small, evil forces were clearly collecting men named Ambrose. Without a doubt, whatever really happened to the author, and infamous cynic was much more mundane than fighting an evil mage king on a planet filled with dinosaurs, as the comic book series Lost Planet suggests. But perhaps the stories written about him are a much more fitting legacy, than the truth would be to the man who helped pioneer the supernatural story. To the man who... 6. Glenn Miller 73 years before Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 became the biggest, most sophisticated plane to ever disappear, a plane-carrying band leader Glenn Miller vanished during World War II. Miller was one of the most popular musicians of the 1930s and 40s, with songs such as In the Mood and Moonlight Serenade. His single engine Norton Norseman disappeared in bad weather, presumably going down in the English Channel, while heading to a Christmas Day concert for troops in Paris in 1944. But the plane and its three occupants were never found. Questions lingering through the decades include whether the plane suffered mechanical problems, or was shot down by friendly fire. Books have also speculated Miller was a spy against the Germans or died under scandalous circumstances. The PBS program History Detectives Special Investigations, The Disappearance of Glenn Miller will explore the mystery Tuesday at 9 p.m. E.T. This was a celebrity story about a guy who was in essence a rock star of his time. He was every bit as big as the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, said Wes Cowan, one of the program's hosts. He joins the Army Air Force to be a patriot and poof, he vanishes. The beloved and bespectacled Miller was more famous than anyone aboard the Malaysia flight, which took off March 8 with 239 people aboard, 
but his flight attracted much less attention immediately. Miller had joined the Army in 1942, at the age of 38 and performed with his Army Air Force Band to boost troop morale. With a friend, he hitched a ride December 15 on a UC-64 Norseman that left a Royal Air Force field called Twinwood Farm. Foggy, freezing weather should have prevented the flight just as a snowstorm should have grounded musician Buddy Holly before his fatal crash in Iowa 14 years later. But Miller was eager to reach Paris for a concert celebrating the troops who had arrived since D-Day months earlier. They never should have been flying that day, Cowan said. They had no permission to fly. About the same time Miller's plane was heading to France, a bombing mission was returning from Germany with its payload because the weather was too stormy to spot targets. But those Lancaster bombers dropped their explosives over the channel before landing, leading to speculation they might have inadvertently hit Miller's plane. The program has taped interviews with a British accident investigator, who reviewed the case in the 1980s, and a possible witness to explore this option. Co-hosts Tukafu Zubri and K.I. Amaglover helped narrow down what might have happened. But one of the frustrations of the case is that a detailed investigation came long after the disappearance. The flight occurred on the eve of a German offensive now known as the Battle of the Bulge, which began the next day and raged for more than a month. A revelation came in January 2012 when the journal of an amateur plane spotter was unearthed and offered new information about the plane's path, and the show explores speculation that has developed over the decades, including the fact that Miller made German-language music recordings, during the war that some have suggested could have conveyed hidden spy messages. Miller also worked with David Niven, the British actor who served as a commando during the war and coordinated with American forces. The show offers a little something for big band fans aviation enthusiasts and those who love a mystery. I think it's an interesting story about a guy who was at the top of his game and wanted to do something for his country, Callan said. They paid the ultimate price for hubris. 7. Richie Edwards It perhaps shouldn't have been a surprise when the news finally came. After all, it had been almost 23 years since he had disappeared without a trace. But when word leaked out this week that the parents of Richie Edwards, the missing Manic Street Preachers guitarist and lyricist, had been granted a court order for their son to be legally presumed dead. It hit many of their thousands of fans harder than even they could have imagined. I burst into tears after reading this, wrote one fan on the popular band forum, forever delayed. Though I always thought he jumped from that bridge, this news broke my heart. That bridge is the Severn Bridge a notorious suicide spot near to which Edwards's car was found 17 days after he first went missing. The last confirmed sighting of the then 27-year-old was at 7 a.m. on February 1, 1995, when he left the Embassy Hotel in London. Despite recent hospitalization for anorexia, self-harm and alcohol problems, he was supposed to fly to America later that day for a tour. But instead, it seems, he drove to his flat in Cardiff, where he left his passport, credit card and Prozac, before heading for the service station nearest the bridge. Then he vanished. His mom and dad, Sherry and Graham, both hairdressers in Blackwood, the ex-mining town in Wales where the band all grew up, put an advert in the press appealing for information. It read, Richard, please make contact. Love mom, dad and Rachel. Martin Hall, the band's manager hired a private investigator. But no word came. Over the years there have been numerous reported sightings in Goa, the Canary Islands and beyond. But the family have refused to believe he was dead. They opted not to use their legal right to begin presumption of death proceedings in 2002, after he had been missing the usual legal minimum of seven years required for the action to be taken. But last month they had a partial change of heart, which reflected, according to the family's lawyer, David Ellis, an acceptance that his affairs have got to be sorted. He added, that's not the same as an acceptance that he is dead. Edwards would be coming up to his 41st birthday on December 22. The family can now release assets frozen in bank accounts since his disappearance. A grant of probate was made on October 13 to release his personal estate of £455,990, 
which was reduced after liabilities to a net value of £377,548. The document issued by the Probate Registry of Wales named his parents as his executors and stated that he had died on or since February 1, 1995. A spokeswoman for the Metropolitan Police said yesterday that though they had retained an open missing persons file on Edwards, the coroner's declaration now meant the case was closed. Edwards left Noble and had no spouse or children so his entire estate is inherited by his parents under intestacy laws. The decision has the blessing of the surviving three members of the Manic Street Preachers, James Dean Bradfield, Nicky Wire and Sean Moore. They have been placing a quarter of the royalties earned by the band in an account for him, should he resurface. Terry Hall the band's publicist whose late husband was their first manager, said, It is hugely emotional for all of us. This is the parents' choice and the band is happy to go with what they decide is best. We all dream Richie will come back one day. But it is no longer a realistic hope and if this offers closure the band will be content with that. The band did not want to comment on the matter. But there have been various clues throughout the year that they knew Edwards was soon to be put to rest, legally at least. At Reading Festival this summer, they dedicated their set to their missing bandmate, and this month announced that all the lyrics on their next album, Out in the Spring, were written by Edwards before he died. Paul Rees, editor-in-chief of Q magazine, said yesterday, I think it's very, very interesting that the band have left it until now to use Richie's lyrics again. It remains to be seen whether they will make the album Richie said he wanted to make just before his death which he described as Pantra meets Nine Inch Nails. But I think it shows some sort of acceptance that he has gone, even if it is at the back of everybody's mind that he might just walk through the door. Tom Branton, who is working on a new edition of the unauthorized Manic's biography, Manic Street Preachers, Sweet Venom, said yesterday, he was obviously a very ill man and it seems strange that he would be able to carry off this great escape. But it's still a case of never say never. 8. Jim Thompson First, he was an American spy. After that, a hugely successful silk magnate. Finally, he was the central figure in a missing persons case, one that remains unsolved almost half a century later. Jim Thompson lived an inimitable life, yet he's better known in Thailand where he spent his last 20 years, than in his native United States. On a narrow street in this hectic city, a museum is devoted to his memory, and to the magnificent home he built here in the 1950s. Enclosed by a perimeter of lush tropical plants, the Jim Thompson House is in a series of elegant teak buildings. Inside, Chinese, Burmese and Thai art line its roomy hallways. A 400-year-old stone sculpture of the Buddha exudes serenity while nearby a basket of tiny yellow silkworms, the silent partners in Thompson's international fabric business, churns with activity. In a bedroom at the property's eastern corner, a framed photo of Thompson, middle-aged and contented, catches light from a pair of adjacent windows. Some visitors say he looks like an older Bruce Willis, a museum's staffer said to my wife and me during a recent visit. Not a bad comparison, Thompson had the actor's hairline, and his story reads like something out of Hollywood. As documented in Joshua Curlant's fascinating 2011 book, The Ideal Man, The Tragedy of Jim Thompson and the American Way of War, Thompson began working undercover before many modern spy agencies even existed. In the 1940s, he joined the Office of Strategic Services, which preceded the CIA and during World War II provided strategic backing to the Allied effort in Europe and North Africa. By the mid-40s he was stationed in Thailand, but before the decade was out, Thompson would trade government service for business. As reflected in Thompson's writings, he warned of serious trouble in the region long before the Vietnam War. Having cultivated his passion for Thai culture from his first days in the country, Thompson seamlessly moved into the silk trade. He spent the next two decades building an enduring commercial empire. To this day, retail stores and restaurants bearing his name are scattered throughout Thailand and other Asian countries. In early 1967, Thompson disappeared somewhere in Malaysia, where he was visiting a friend. Given his eventful past, some speculated that the 61-year-old American immigrant was murdered 
but 47 years later the case remains unsolved. At the Jim Thompson house, Thompson's mysterious final days are a mere footnote to the life he built during his two decades in Thailand. For an extremely affordable entrance fee of 100 Thai baht, a little more than $3, visitors can tour the grounds, catch some sun in a spacious courtyard and learn about the silk manufacturing process that made Thompson wealthy. When we visited, a brightly attired young man was seated on a stool near the museum's entrance, his hands busy at a wooden spinning wheel that enabled him to extract strands of silk from small white cocoons. The house is a traditional Thai construction, roofs resolve into sharp points, and ground floors are elevated on posts to guard against flooding, but it's not a local product. As our tour guide explained, Thompson made his home out of six smaller dwellings several of which were disassembled and transported from the historic city of Yudhaya, 50 miles away. Thompson, though, was only able to enjoy his home for a brief time. It was 1959, when he moved in. He vanished eight years later, a baffling conclusion to an intriguing life. 9. Renee McRae The family of an Inverness mother and her young son have said they are heartbroken that their disappearance remains unexplained 40 years on. Renee and Andrew McRae, who was three, vanished on November 12, 1976. Mrs. McRae's burned-out BMW was discovered that night in a lay-by on the A9 south of Inverness. In statement, the family said it was collectively heartbroken the pair remained missing 40 years on but were still hopeful of finding answers. Police Scotland said an investigation into their disappearance remain ongoing. On the evening of her disappearance Mrs. McRae, 36, had set off to meet her lover Bill McDowell in Perth but he insisted they never met. There has been speculation that Renee McRae and her son were murdered, and their bodies buried at either a quarry or at construction works for the A9. In 2004, Police searched nearby Dal McGarry Quarry but no bodies were found. Two years later a report naming a suspect who may have killed the pair was sent to prosecutors, but they decided there was insufficient evidence to take action. It has been reported recently that an anomaly has been detected by ground-penetrating radar in the foundations of a bridge near the lay-by where the car was found. However, Police Scotland said its inquiries indicated construction work did not start in this area until some time after Mrs. McRae's disappearance. The force said it would nonetheless liaise with contractors involved in the current A9 upgrade in an effort to explain the radar anomaly. In their newly released statement, the family said, 40 years have passed since the disappearance of Rene and Andrew and as a family we remain collectively heartbroken to have lost a much-loved and cherished mother, sister, brother and friend to many. We cannot give up hope that somebody holds information which could help lead us to the answers as to what happened to our beloved Renee and Andrew. Our message is it is never too late. We are confident these answers will come from the local community, and as a family we urge that person to come forward, until such time the person who caused harm to Renee and Andrew will continue to escape justice and we will be without closure. Did Superintendent Jim Smith of Police Scotland's major investigations Team North, said, as in all cases such as these, there is a family quite rightly seeking answers and closure. We are determined to do all we can to find those answers, and to that end continue to maintain contact with the family of Christine McRae and Andrew McRae as the years go on. The passage of time is no barrier and we continue to urge anyone who may have information that could assist the investigation to come forward.